sing Tall Black Dogs. And there's room out here for dancing.
kesinlikle. Even if I fear, I fear peers, war threatens to start. The love of God is the strength of my life. My mouth will praise you. The sky will sing your deeds, asking in a prayer to achieve the blessing of joy. Let us get to fulfillment in his commandments and never stop. Let us love all the light and the darkness. Let us shine like a star in space. God, let us grow up. Let us rejoice, dance, and love to love. We will accept it all without questioning. Clouds above us, happiness is great in our hearts. The sky is big and we collect moments. The day will come, our heart will beat in heaven. Supreme love, connecting with eternal light.
like just a, the, the spirit of God just flowed through you. This morning's parish I won't give any prizes for what this one's called. Anyone knows what this parish is called? It is. It is. Come on. We might as well go home. There's no price. <laughs> That's what the problem is. Ah. We've got condition these days. Well, the readings this morning are from Shemot, Exodus 33 and 34. And then Isaiah. Yeah. And the parish, then the Brother Havisham readings a little bit later on. Oh, cool. So we start off with Mr. Barry. Shabbat shalom, And Moses said to Yahweh, See, you are saying to me, Bring up this people. But you have not made known to me whom you would send with me. Though you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my eyes. And now, please, if I have found favor in your eyes, please show me your way and let me know you, so that I find favor in your eyes. And consider that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence does go, and I shall give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence is not going, do not lead, lead us up from here. For how then shall it be known that I have found favor in your eyes, and I and your people except you go with us? And we shall be distinguished, and I your people, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Even this word you have spoken I shall do. For you have found favor in my eyes, and I know you by name. And he said, Please show me your esteem. And he said, I shall cause my goodness to pass before you, and I shall proclaim the name of Yahweh before you. And I shall favor him whom I favor, and shall have compassion on him whom I have compassion. But he said, You are unable to see my face, for no man does see me and live. And Yahweh said, See, there is a place with me, and you shall stand on the rock, and it shall be. My esteem passes by, while my, my esteem passes by, that I shall put you in the cleft of the rock, and cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I shall take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. said to Moses, carve for yourself two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write upon them the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready by the morning, come up to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. No one is to come up with you and do not let anyone be seen throughout the entire mountain. Even the flocks and herds must not graze in front of that mountain. So he carved two tablets of stone like the first. Then Moses rose up early in the morning, went up onto Mount Sinai as Adonai had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Then Adonai descended in the cloud, stood with him there as he called on the name of Adonai. Then Adonai passed before him and proclaimed... Now, I've written a note here that's 
calling this next section the sinner's prayer. So somebody clever has told me that. So maybe think about that as I read this. This is not from me, but anyway, let's see if you think it sounds like that. But this is interesting that this is Adonai speaking now, telling us who he is. And he says, Adonai, Adonai, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth, showing mercy to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means leaving the guilty unpunished but bringing the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Then Moses quickly bowed his head down to the earth and worshipped. He said, If now I have found grace in your eyes, my Lord, let my Lord please go within our midst, even though this is a stiff-necked people, Pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your own inheritance. Oh, that sounds like the sinner's prayer, doesn't it? Thanks, Stefan. Then he said, I am cutting a covenant before all your people. I will do wonders such as have not seen, been seen, such as <laughs> before all your people I will do wonders such as have not been done in all the earth or in any nation. All the people you are among will see the work of Adonai, for what I am going to do with you will be awesome. <laughs> Obey what I am commanding you today. Behold, I am going to drive out the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites. <coughs> Hivites, Jebusites before you, watch yourself and make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, or they will become a snare among you. Instead, you must break down their altars, smash their pillars, and cut down their Asherah poles, for you are to bow down to no other god, because Adonai is jealous for his name. He is a jealous god. See that you do not make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. Otherwise, when they prostitute themselves with their gods and sacrifice to their gods, someone will invite you and you will eat from their sacrifice. Do not take their daughters for your sons, for their daughters will prostitute themselves with their own gods and cause your sons to prostitute themselves with their gods. You are not to make for yourselves metal gods. You are to keep the feast of Matzot, for seven days you eat matzot, as I commanded you, at the time appointed in the month of Eve. For in the month of Eve you came out from Egypt. Every firstborn of the womb is mine, and from all your cattle you are to sanctify the males, the firstborn of the ox and sheep. A firstborn donkey you are to redeem with a lamb, but if you do not redeem it, then you are to break its neck. You must redeem all your firstborn sons. No one should appear before me empty-handed. For six days you will work, but on the seventh day you will rest. During plowing time and harvest, you must rest. You are to observe the feast of Shavuot, which is the first fruits of the wheat harvest, as well as the feast of ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times during the year, all your males are to appear before Adonai Elohim, God of Israel. For I am going to cast out nations before you, then enlarge your territory, so no one will covet your land when you go up to appear before Adonai your God three times in the year. You are not to offer the blood of my sacrifice with Hametz, nor should the sacrifice of the Passover festival remain until morning. You are to bring the choicest fruits of your land to the house of Adonai, your God. You must not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Jesse, and a branch will bear fruit out of his roots. The Ruach 
of Adonai will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and insight, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Adonai. His delight will be in the fear of Adonai. He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the poor of the land. He will strike the land with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. Also, righteousness will be the belt round his loins, faithfulness the belt round his waist. Then we drop down to um, 12 verses 1 to 6. In that day you will say, I will give you thanks, Adonai, for though you are angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord Adonai is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, Give thanks to Adonai. Proclaim his name. Declare his works to the people, so they remember his exalted name. Sing to Adonai, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One. Last night I was listening to our brother who did a testimony on Exodus 13 and it spoke to me and it talked about when I read my Bible to bring in the Holy Spirit and then I was given this to read and the first one says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall rise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined ones, the devastation of many ge generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks, foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonour they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore in their land they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For I the Lord love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations, 
and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself in a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth and sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations.
Matthew 27, verse 62. On the next day, which was after the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Master, we remember, while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, After three days I am raised. Command them that the tomb be safe guarded until the third day, lest his taught once come by night and steal him away. And should say to the people, He was raised from the dead. The last deception shall be worse than the first. So Pilate said to them, You have a watch. Go, safeguard it as you know how. And they went and safeguarded the tombs, sealing the stone and setting the watch. Good morning. Now, it's from Luke chapter 23, verses 50 to 56. Now, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and righteous man. He had not been in agreement with the council and their action. He was from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for Yeshua's body. And he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb cut out of the rock, where no one had ever yet been laid. Now it was the day of preparation, and Shabbat was approaching. The woman who had come with him from Galilee followed and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes. But on Shabbat, they rested according to the commandment. similar now but from another passage so we must need to hear this twice <laughs> after this Joseph of Armatarim sorry who was a Talmud of Yeshua but a secret one out of fear of the Judeans asked Pilate if he could have Yeshua's body Pilate gave his consent so Joseph came and took the body away also Nakdemon who was the first who had gone to see Yeshua by night, came with some 70 pounds of spice, a mixture of myrrh and aloes. They took Yeshua's body and wrapped it in linen sheets with the spices in keeping with Judean burial practice. In the vicinity of where he had been executed was a garden, and in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had ever been buried. So because it was preparation day for the Judeans, and because the tomb was close by, that is where they buried Yeshua. At Revelation 1 and verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. But he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the one who lives. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever more. Moreover, I hold the keys of death and Sheol. Therefore, write down what you have seen, what is and what will happen after all these things.
Well, last week's uh, parasha was about Mitzorah. It's to do with the persons who are afflicted by Tsa'arat, by skin diseases. <clears throat> now, this could be considered an appropriate build-up to yesterday's preparation uh, day for Pesach, or more correctly called Mavetz Hamatzot. Festival of the Unleavened. And the earlier part of the day is actually spent spring cleaning to remove the chametz from the house. This represents sin and that has afflicted the nature of mankind since Adam and Eve. And in the same vein, mankind has been afflicted with Zarak, causing him to be unclean and causing separation between God and man. Yeshua stated these things make a man unclean. These particular ones, he says. For out of the heart come evil thoughts. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. It's interesting that he selected those. But these need not have control over us. For just as those with the skin disease were outside alone, Yeshua was abandoned by his father alone. And he cried, Father, why have you forsaken me? He had the disease of us all laid on him. And when we feel isolated and alone, and we can be comforted that Yeshua actually understands exactly how you feel. When we feel isolated and alone, we can be confident as he understands how we feel. When we feel isolated and alone, we can feel confident that Yeshua understands exactly how you feel. I could put that on repeat. <laughs> yeah. And I could do it again and again and yeah, again. It's true. Until you actually let it sink in and actually believe it. Because then you will actually go and ask him every time. Then he'll be the first person of call that you will actually go to when you're not feeling so good. <clears throat> Rather than necessarily pouring it on someone else. Not that that's a bad thing. But they won't listen in quite the same way. And with a quite the same empathy and love and care that you sure does. Mind you, it is sometimes nice to have a human face on it. Our uncleanness is made clean because of his love and obedience. Messiah Yeshua will come again to heal all Tsarat in our world. And on that day, he will be exalted to rule and reign forever upon the throne of David. What a wonderful, joyous Pesach memorial and Anzac commemoration. They're both pictures of freedom that we celebrated this week with the daily devotions following the happenings that occurred within Jonah's three days and three nights of prophecy. We Yeshua died for us on Wednesday, late afternoon, the 14th of Aviv, just before Pesach, so that he would rise again as Shabbat ends on sundown. Tonight. And most importantly, we experienced in part what our Hebrew and Sojourner forefathers did. Yahweh's salvation in and from Egypt and his ongoing preparation and build up to the ultimate sacrifice 
and redemption of mankind when Yeshua HaMashiach died. If it had ended there, we would have still been able to say, or would you have still been able to say, day only? It would have been enough. Well, yes and no. Yes, because we accept his will be done, and he would have provided a way as per the early Kedoshim, the early holy ones. Yet no, as his whole plan and was a total restoration, a freedom totally from sin, not just it being covered. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 17 points out, and if Mashiach has not been raised, your faith is futile, meaningless. You are still in your sins. Hence he has risen. He has risen indeed. Hallelujah. Isn't that exciting? Yeah, it is exciting. It is. Didn't have too many onions, but... Are we just waking up, I guess? Yeah, you can sing us up soon. Now, well, this week's um, Pesach, or Matzot 5, day 5, which falls on the Shabbat, it shows us that keeping Chemet's sin, or leaven, out of our lives is actually continuous and an ongoing process, as mentioned by Joshua. Thank you, Joshua. It was last night. I not defined by Shabbats or weeks. And 1 Corinthians 5, 7 to 8 encourages us to celebrate not with old chemits, the chemits of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread, the matzah of sincerity and truth. And what's that based on? The ten words of Yahweh. Gave Moshe on Mount Sinai. These in turn actually depict who Yahweh is more, is more um, than. Oh yeah, this in turn this depicts who Yahweh is more than what He requires. A lot of people always keep thinking about, it, and they read it and they think about the Torah. They think about what He requires. Why is this that? But it actually teaches us about who he is. It's interesting that these were prefaced. Who knows what the word prefaced means? Comes before. By the attributes of Yahweh. His desire and motives were all about restoring relationship between himself and his highest order. Of creation, you and me. The imagery of what Moshe did for Israel in Shemot 32, which we didn't read, but it goes before what we were reading, um, after they sinned with the golden calf, where he offers to make atonement for his people's sins. This is Moshe. Interesting. So they wouldn't be destroyed. But he said, please forgive them. I'm sure all of you would do this for the person beside you, who you did love. Please forgive them, but if not, please blot me out of your book. I know you would all do that. <laughs> and it has a similar ring, doesn't it? To what Yeshua cried out to his father. In Matthew 26 to 39, what does it say? Abba, if it's possible for this cup to pass from me, yet not your will, yet your will be done. And in verse, again in verse 43, my Abba, if this cannot pass away, 
unless I drink of it, let your will be done. And that's why Moshe was considered a pre-example of Yeshua. He was prepared to lay his life down. And so the die had been cast because they were proving to be a stiff-necked people. Hence on, that was what we were talking about, the, um, the golden calf. Mm. Only to set themselves up for a further exile. Oh, sorry. Hence, they were to, um, the stiff-necked people. Hence, on the one hand, having been freed from 400 years of slavery in exile, they went on the next journey of setting themselves up for a further exile of 2,700 years for some of them, some of the 10 tribes of Israel, and 2,700 years, sorry, 2,070 years for the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And those of the 10 tribes who actually did return with them from Babylon. Yet Isaiah declares that Yahweh will provide a way home for the remnant. And he has. Again showing Yahweh's mercy and love. Irrespective of the fact they were stiff-necked people. And are. But it is wonderful to know that and see the change that is occurring. There's different ones turning yeah. to Yeshua. It's generally not those who are religious. It's more than those that don't generally believe anything. They're actually turning because there's an emptiness inside. Yeah. There's a longing, an ache to be fulfilled. The Hebrew prophet Isaiah he sheds light on this amazing promise of a future redemption for Israel. And it will also come about in that day that my Lord will again redeem, reclaim, a second time with his hand, the remnant of his people who remain from Assyria, from Egypt. You know where Assyria is? Persia, Iran is Persia. Do you know where the capital of ISIS was? Mosul. Mosul. Mosul is very close to where, um, where, where, where Jonah went to visit. Nineveh. Nineveh. Yeah. Syria. That's the area up that top end. So we'll keep coming back down through there. From Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush. Where's Cush? Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Yeah. So it's, yeah. And which a lot of people actually came through, have come through from there so far. It's quite a, it's about a million and a half. And interesting enough, they considered. They, they are, do cause a problem in Israel. Oh, yes. <laughs> Mainly because they don't follow the rabbinic, um, the Talmud or the uh, writings because they went down with what they knew and it only included the Torah. So they're a bit like the Karaites who just stick with the Torah. But many of them came to Yeshua as well. Also coming from Elam, Shina, Babylonia, Hamath, and from the farthest islands of the sea, New Zealand. So 
Isaiah 11 verse 11. This, in, in, this um, in gathering of the exiles of Israel has already begun. A sure sign. that the end is on its way. The prophecy of Isaiah 66, 7 to 8, foreshadows the rebirth of Israel, which happened in one day and was fulfilled in 1948. Millions of Jews have migrated to Israel since then. In the future, all the scattered people of Judah will come home from the four quarters of the earth the uh, the prophet uh, Jeremiah also spoke about this coming greater exodus which will completely refrain how we refer to God it says however the days are coming declares Yahweh when it will no longer be said as surely as the Lord who lives who brought the Israelites out of Egypt but it will be said as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of the land of the north and out of the countries where he had banished them. For I will restore them to the land I gave their ancestors. And I will rejoin the two states and make them one. Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah. Jeremiah tells us that at first God will send fishermen for fish for his people and nations. But after this time of grace, he will send hunters to hunt for them, to bring them out of the land of their exile, to which they cling in false hopes of security and comfort. So waiting for those hunters. But now I will send, oh, for, uh, this is in Jeremiah 16 verse 16, that's what it said. It says they will catch them and take them back. Today in synagogues around the world, chapter 11 of Isaiah, a well-known messianic uh, prophecy will be read. It says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a Nexa branch will bear fruit. When we look at the Hebrew, we see a wonderful connection between this messianic prophecy and Yeshua. In the Hebrew word for branch in this passage, Netza, which can mean branch, shoot or twig or sprout or descendant. And the same three uh, root letters, the N, the Tzat there, and the Resh, and with different vowels, Natsa, which actually means to watch, to guard and to keep. And these three root words or letters can be used in the context of collective believers in Yeshua which is called Natsarut in Hebrew. So to become a believer of Yeshua is an Itzir. A related word, or Natsare, um, is used for the disciple of Yeshua. As someone who follows Yeshua Natsare, or Yeshua of Natsaret, Nazareth. And you're going to remember all that, aren't you? And hence, early believers were actually called Nazarene. What does that kind of sound like? Nazarenes. Yeah. Who were led by James Yaakov, the brother of Yeshua. They were considered a sect of Judaism in the first century. And in Acts 24, verse 5, Apostle Shaul was accused of being the ringleader of the Nazarene. It should be noted that as Shabbat keeping believers in the 3rd and 4th centuries and later, they continued to defy, to defy Emperor Constantine's 
um, dictates for believers to change to the first day worship, his son worship. And increasingly they became known as the Nazarenes. And I've actually, a number of actually continued to utilise that through to about the 17th century. And then it wasn't used for a period. Um, even the Hebrew language itself contains this knowledge that Yeshua of Nazareth came as a Netzer, as a branch out of Yeshua, of yes, Jesse. And from Jesse, Yeshua, um, came the mighty King David. And through the lineage of David came Yeshua ben David, Jesus, the son of David, who sits on the throne eternally. That's Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. And Isaiah prophesies that the Spirit of the Lord would rest upon this branch out of the stump of Jesse. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him and the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding and the Spirit of counsel and of might and the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And Yeshua refers to this messianic um, prophecy from Isaiah when he entered the synagogue on Mount Shabbat. And he read it from Isaiah 61, which we read this morning. And as he stood before the entire congregation, he declared, the, prof the prophecy fulfilled in him. And after he had read it, he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant. And he, and he sat down and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue was fastened on him. Imagine being there at the time and wondering and pondering yourself. He began to say to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And then Yeshua, after declaring to, to Martha that he was the resurrection and the life, and requesting, she was, so she was the, the second woman he, he spoke to about, the first was who? The Samaritan woman. Yeah. Yeah. The first, the first woman spoke to her about it. And she accepted it. And the guys just went and got some food. Interesting. <laughs> she talked to Martha. And she gets she often gets a, a bad rap, doesn't she? Yeah. She's really my girl. <laughs> My room's okay. But Martha, yeah. She puts things into practice. For me, faith of that works is dead. <laughs> and I like my food. <laughs> but anyway, she uh, she requested that the, to that the tomb stone be rolled away from her brother Lazarus' tomb. He proclaimed freedom for his friend Lazarus, speaking life into him after four days in the grave, foreshadowing what would actually happen to him. That was Yeshua. And he believed in, including Martha. But this has also triggered the plot of the ruling, the, the ruling Kohanim and the Pharisees. Did you wonder when it was the plot was actually? Started? Started straight after this. Interesting. In short space of time, there was a lot, there was a lot of rolling and a lot of unrolling. The next lot of rolling and unrolling was at Yeshua's own grave. After three days, as per the sign of Yonah. It's interesting, the reason why I was reading the different passages. One's two say, on the third day. The other one says, after. One lot were 
eyewitnesses, the other lots were, had got testimonies from everyone else. You get different pictures, different things. What did Yeshua say? His own words. The only prophecy I'm going to give you is, the only example I'm going to give you is, what? Jonah. Jonah. Well, you can't be a bit more, more, more explicit than that. Because what does it say? Three days and three nights. The prophecy, death is swallowed up in victory. Where in death is your sting? This was a trigger point that destroyed Satan's plan, commencing the next phase in Yahweh's redemptive plan of restoration. Exciting. Developing and building a body of believers who would, over the next 2,000 years, prepare the way for Yeshua to return as Yeshua ben David, the King of Kings. And what happened during the three days? Do you ever wonder? The scripture doesn't talk much about what happens in the three days. It just kind of flicks on. It's just, oh yeah, 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 next thing, do yeah. What happened during the three days? Yeshua was in the tomb. Was he just having a sleep? Was he just waiting to be resurrected? No, he was on a mission. So a lot of debate about what where Yeshua meant and what he did. The Apostles' Creed said he had descended into hell. Where's that? What's that? And why? Did he have to go and experience hell? No. Not at all. <laughs> to speak to the prisoners. Mm -hmm. Set captives free. But where were they? Were they in Hades or within the holding pit? Were they, were, they, were they in Gehenna? Or were they in Greek, the Greek term is Hades? Or Shul? Shul is actually a realm with two divisions. A place of blessing and a place of judgment. You read Matthew 11, 23 or 16, 18. Luke 10, 15, 16, 23. Acts 2, 27 to 31. You've all got a photographic memory. You've read those already. <laughs> and the abodes of the saved and the lost are both generally called, called that. Called Hades. Or in the Greek, or Sheol. There are two divisions. Now the, abode, the abode of the saved is called Abraham's bosom. Or when Yeshua spoke to the thief on the cross, what did he say? Paradise. Yeah. Because and, and why? Because he said today. He didn't say tomorrow or the next day or the day after. He said today you will be with me in paradise. Right. We know where Paradise is. We even know the story about the rich man and the and Lazarus, don't we? Across the Great Divide. The abodes of the saved and the departed. In the, he in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, the word used is Sheol, which simply means the place of the dead or the place of the departed souls, spirits. In the, in the uh, New Covenant, Greek equivalent is Hades. The, the New Testament or New Covenant indicates that Sheol is a temporary place. The souls are kept as they await the final resurrection and judgment. There's a lot of discussion and debate and depends how you have studied it and what and, and why you come to the conclusion. 
You just need to read what the words actually say in the scriptures. And the Holy Spirit will let you know. It's, it's, not, a say, it's, not, it's not about um, whether you'll be saved or not saved. <laughs> but it, it, it's an interesting one. Everyone wants to go to heaven straight up. And it's an interesting one whether or not we do or don't. That's for you to decide. I'm not going to tell you either way. <laughs> Revelation 20, 11 to 15, makes a clear distinction between uh, Sheol and the lake of fire. Gehenna. The lake of fire is the permanent and last place of judgment for the lost. Sheol is a temporary place. And many people refer to, to both them as hell. But that's because the same as they don't understand, when they're talking about who God is, they don't really understand the complex unity of God. And that's why he gave his name. That's, that's why he explained it, who, who he was. The Lake of Fire, um, uh, and, th and those that it already have been defined to um, Gehenna. It is a place of torment after his death. It's interesting. And it's, and it's about whether your name is written in the book of life. But that defines it. Because in the end there will be a, a judgment. And then and there will also be a celebration. One will be by the great judgment throne. And the other one, for those that you sure acknowledge and their names in the book, will only stand before the being seat. Acknowledging what they have, have done. And rewards passed out. Man. So did Yeshua go to Sheol? Yes. In his own words. He went to the blessed region of Sheol. And interesting enough, where did he get the keys from? Did he wrestle it with from Satan? You're allowed to answer. It's yeah. He already had the keys. Satan's never had the keys. They, all, they always belong to God. God. God is actually in charge of the whole thing. In actual, in actual fact, if you read Jude, Jude it says that the, a lot of the uh, fallen angels, actually, that's where they were sent. And that's where they remained, locked up. So when people talk about um, uh, evil angels around all the time, yes, there are some battling in the heavens, but the majority are actually locked up. So there's, and there's millions and millions and millions of um, angels of light. So you don't have to worry a thing. If one comes to you and tries to oppress you, and you have the authority to be sure, you just tell them where to go. Because all authority is placed in you. So don't worry about that at all. So yes, he, he had the keys. He's got the keys. It was his shed blood that affected our cleansing from sin. It was what, and uh, it says, as he hung on, on the cross, he took the sin burden of the whole human race upon himself. And the reason why he actually did go down to to hell because 
that's where the sin of the world belongs. In Gehenna. So he dropped it off where it belonged. It's interesting also, when he, when he was near, near his death, he said, it is finished. And his suffering in our place was completed. His soul, his spirit, they went to, to Hades, to, to the place of the dead. To bring freedom. And to speak to those that were there, the reason being is that the righteous ones were there. And so they'd, always, they'd, be, they'd already be found righteous because of their deeds. And so Yeshua imparted on them that he was now their righteousness. And so he replaced their righteous deeds, which did make them righteous before Yeshua. That's what it says. But once he came, he replaced it with his righteousness. And that put them on, that puts them on even Stephens. Because that is who our God is. He is fair. He is caring. And this evening, as Matthew declares in 28 with 1, now after Shabbat, we will so celebrate the memorial of Yeshua's resurrection. Hallelujah. Death could not hold him down. Yeshua rose as the bickering, the Messiah, the first fruits. This is the third part of the Pesach celebration. Pesach is actually one day. Then you have Matzatop, seven days, which overlaps. And then you have Bethlehem. It was celebrated by the priests by waving two barley loaves before Yahweh. And this commenced the countdown of the Omer to Shavuot, being also a 50-day spiritual count-up to the outpouring of the Ruach HaGadash, the Holy Spirit. God had us all sorted. It's exciting. He, he didn't just get everyone ready and lift them hanging, lift them with their own strength. No. He had it all planned to, to bring the Comforter, send the Comforter. The Father sent the Comforter to the Spirit of God to dwell with you and me and that's why he's here right now with us, watching over us, not snooping on us. He's with us, willing you on, encouraging you, guiding you, helping you, wanting you to be the best that you can be. That's what the Holy Spirit's role is for. That's what he wants to do. Apostle Paul, Rabbi Shaul, also links the ceremony during Pesach with the resurrection of Yeshua. 1 Corinthians 15 says, But now Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by the man came death, by a man came death, and by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah, Yeshua, Messiah, all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Messiah, the first fruits, and after those who are Messiahs at his returning. And even the grave will not have power to hold us. For like Messiah, we too shall be raised to resurrection life. Praise be to God. 
and father of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. For his great mercy, he's given us birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Yeshua, the Messiah from the dead. One Kepha, one Peter, one verse three. But now the Messiah is risen, in Corinthians 15, from the dead and is the first fruits of those asleep. He was the first fruit of on the festival of first fruits, and he rose from the dead. And those, then those in him rose and were seen walking around, or somewhere seen walking around Jerusalem. And this is Yeshua's first fruit of the crop. He would bring his father an amazing harvest, which would continue on. Again, this festival forces us to think to the future as we consider what we will bring for this festival. The best thing that we can offer and bring is our lives. That we have been influenced to come to know Yeshua as a Savior. May this be our offering. Bringing others to know Adonai is the only thing that we won't get to do eternally. So now is the time while you're not six feet under. When the root of Jesse, the Messiah, Ben David, returns as the Lion of Judah, not only with all of Israel, he's saved, but all the nations will seek him. And what will be left for God's people to do? but to give thanks for his love and mercy that endures forever. This count up, rather than countdown, is a preparation time. Each day is an opportunity to sit before your Lord and to ask him to shine a light on your heart, my heart, to reveal anything that we need to change and to celebrate how far we have come. Life and relationships, they do bring pressure on us to look at our hearts, even if we don't ask the Holy Spirit to show us what's in our heart. But remember when he wants to bring change, he does give you the strength to do it. So don't beat yourself up. And to change us, he provides the way. And the way of thought. And to help us how to bring change to our attitudes and to our conversations. And each of us, as each of us have been shown and received Yahweh's saving grace through Yeshua, let us show the way to others to experience the great hope of redemption, restoration, and deliverance that's provided in his word until he returns. That's our task. Yeah. Enjoy it. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.
morning. spices of myrrh and alloys, as was the Judean custom. So we can celebrate his resurrection. So the priests waved barley loaves, but today we're going to wave some ribbons in the celebration of his resurrection, the first fruits. So zikra is something that happens after um, the, the death of someone, but instead of it being a sad time, for us it's a celebration. Yeah. 